1 Peter chapter 5. Now let us read for context sake, verses 10 to 14. All right? We focus on verse 14 tonight, but we shall read from 10 to 14 reading. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. And let us all turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal Almighty God, we thank you for gathering us safely into thy house once again. And Lord, we, as we see the events in the world unfolding, Lord, we are truly more and more thankful for every opportunity that we can have this freedom of worship to travel to thy church, to study your word without fear, without disruption. So we thank you for this, O God. Forgive us wherein we've been taking all this for granted all these years. And Lord, we come seeking afresh the thorough cleansing and washing and purging of all our sins. Lord, that this night of gathering will be pleasing in your sight. Show us our sins, O God, that we may confess and repent. And Lord, we do pray that your Holy Spirit Lord, will move mightily in our hearts and cause us to understand your word and, Lord, to desire and to go forth and live out what we learn. And Lord, be um, with the facilitators, use them likewise, Lord, to strengthen the sheep. Lord, be in thy house tonight to richly be blessed through the study of your word. And Lord, we pray for all this, Lord, so that thy church will be strong by having strong Christians and that the next, the next generation Lord, will be godly. So, Lord, we pray that you be pleased to answer the prayer for the study of thy word tonight. We ask and we pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so now, last week we studied about greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Remember, greet is a command. It's very odd, very strange, right? You command someone to greet each other in church. Well, it is needed because it is a time when they were under great persecution. Now, having this greeting of kissing one another with charity, this concern for one another, this care for one another, is easily um, forgotten. Everyone is worried about their own lives. So it must be commanded, all right? It must be commanded, under, especially under such situation, that they, we do not forget for ourselves as well. As we go through life, it is easy for us to be very self-centered, to just keep worrying about our own family problems, our own um, problems as singles, as elders, elderly, as students. Now, we can forget about others. When we come to church, we just live in our own world, right? We want to be loved, but we don't bother to love others, right? So, it's, a, it's an important commandment. Now, not only that, under persecution, the church... Um, can easily fall apart, right? It's unity within the church that will strengthen them. Why would Peter find it necessary to command them to have such unity among themselves? Why? They're strangers and pilgrims. They're supposed to do the kingdom's work. They're supposed to further God's kingdom on earth. That is why they are left on earth as strangers and pilgrims. Now, if there is no unity in the church, they will fail. Satan can roar from without. The church can become stronger if it's united. But if we fall into the prey of Satan's deception, this unity within the church is a far more powerful tool of Satan. So as strangers and pilgrims, they are left there especially in a very difficult time, to shine brightly for Christ, to bring souls 
to come to the Saviour, to do the work of the church. So they must be commanded. If there be any in the church that continue to hold grudges, that would not be united, that will be selfish, self-seeking, self-centered, then they must hear these words and they will realize, I'm commanded to greet one another with a kiss of charity, right? Not the kiss of betrayal, not the kiss of anger, right? Hypocrisy, but a kiss of charity, a genuine desire to be united together. So even this charity has a purpose. Christian, always remember that. Now, if you look at your context, please look at chapter 5. Now, in verse 11, as we, as we studied earlier, Peter broke out into a doxology. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, he was stirred and overflowing, right, with a deep desire to magnify Jesus Christ. And then he says, you must make sure that you are united. It is not simply to have a church that is we are peaceful, we can enjoy each other's company. Ultimately, this greeting being commanded is to ensure that the church is not only united in doctrines, but united in practices, united in heart to prevent Satan from getting inroads. And then the glory and dominion of God for that particular church will fail. I hope that BPCWA will always remember this, right? Whatever it is that you bear grudges against another, put it aside for the sake of the glory of God, the dominion, the work of God. Because if you don't, sooner or later, you'll be used of Satan, right? To stir um, unhappiness in the church, in its directions, in its work. And there will be, you'll be a great tool for him. Right? So they must be united. They must have a care for one another. There must be genuine um, hospitality and charity towards others to help them, to encourage them. All right, so now we learned that. But we also learned, all right, so I come back to Wei Chen, right? I asked you last week, and then you kind of didn't get it so sharp, right? So Wei Chen, now, what kind of love is this? You cannot use Ellen's word, huh? biblical love. <laughs> what kind of charity is this? Oh, you still didn't learn from last week. What kind of love is this that would help the church be strong? Howard? Okay, sacrificial love. Um, that's correct, but how do you sacrifice? Use my time, use my resources. But what are you trying to achieve in this love? Maybe I ask if Kelvin, can you, uh, Kelvin? Yeah, Kelvin, can you remember? What is the purpose? We know what the purpose of this love is, and therefore, what kind of love must it be? Okay, agape love. All right, last one. Uh, Michelle. Okay, agape love. Now, we spend some time on this, all right? So we are forgetful people. Please remember. Now, they, were, they needed to help each other in a very trying time, not to deny Christ, not to fall into sin. In fact, look at chapter 4. Now, Peter told them in verse 4, they will think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. The Christian under persecution, now they will also be um, ostracized for living their faith. Now, so you think about this. Under such condition, what kind of love do you think they did? Nathan. A love what? A love for God's word. Yes, um, that leads to obedience, right? 
Now, they are facing all this, the temptation to sin, the temptation to fall, to fear, when the roaring lion roars loudly at them. The temptation to compromise is very strong. So this love is one, it's not only just, now if you look at chapter 4, now he has already covered the hospitality part, um, the um, charity part, right? The behaviours, the actions of giving, sharing your time, sharing your resources, all right? But here, now in this closing, we must also not forget the kind of love that we must give is we must be ready, all right, to even help someone when they fall into sin to correct them. They are tempted to deny Christ, to encourage them, to strengthen them if, if they want to, want to give in to sin, all right, to run with them once again. They may even need to rebuke them. Now, that is why you look at chapter 5, now, verse, verse 2. Now, the elders are told to feed the flock, taking oversight, not for any other reason, all right? It is God's heritage, in verse 3, to make sure that they guide, look after, correct. Hence, if you look at verse, verse, uh, verse 5, now, likewise, the youngest, submit yourselves unto the elder, right? Why? Why tell the church and one another to have love, to help one another, to guide one another, to even rebuke and correct one another when needed? So, in other words, it is not what churches today think church should be. Church should be loving. Do not correct sins. Do not point out sins, all right? It's all about being nice to one another, right? It's not just that. Of course, that, we've, that is so, right? Being kind, generous, helpful. We've covered that in great detail in chapter 4 already. But here in the closing, there is a great need for them to glorify God and living in sin, disobedience, compromise, does not glorify God, right? So here is another aspect of love that we must remember in the church. Now, with that, all right, with that, question number seven from last week. Now, what kind of Christian love must I, having understood the principle of Christian greeting, what kind of Christian love must I have, all right, must I show, must I show, having understood the principle? Now, in other words, what kind of Christian love? Now, we must give the right kind of love, all right, as I've mentioned, the right kind of love. The devil is prowling, seeking whom he may devour. Please remember that. The Christian that is in church next to you may be one of them. And when they are tempted, you must give the right love. Correct, rebuke, challenge. Now then, brotherly love and goodwill and, um, and um, generosity to one another now must also be received. Now, having understood this, now you understand this kind of love. We've covered in chapter 4 the generosity, the kindness, the help, all right? Now, by the way, we can give wrong help, all right? We can give wrong help, even when we be generous to someone. If you realize that being generous to someone will cause the person to actually continue in laziness, all right, in, um, in not watching how they spend the money, you need to be careful, right? So, now, and then, what kind of Christian must I be? Oh, sorry, must I be? I'm correct. What kind of Christian must I be? I must be the kind of Christian not only that give the right love, I must be the kind of Christian that, was, that is ready to receive such love, right? So, the key answer to question number seven, I hope that we realize is, now, the fact that it's greet one another, Greet ye one another. When you are greeted with a love that helps you to change, you must not, well, please stay far away from me. All right? Don't kiss me. Don't greet me. Don't speak to me. The kind of Christian we must be, we must be ready to receive, rebuild, guidance, correction for the sake of the church, for the sake of the kingdom's work. For the sake of your spiritual life, we must be ready to receive such things. 
is greet one another. Greet one another. This is not just about being cordial, being nice to one another in church, and that is all. All right? We must be nice, we must be cordial, we must be courteous to one another, we must be caring towards one another. But this final greeting is not just the physical act, that is all. Right? So it goes beyond that. The whole aim of it is to help one another. Now, when someone helps us and tells us, you are going down the wrong road spiritually, correct certain wrong thinking or behavior, any correction that can help us be better, any kiss of charity that can help us be spiritually better, we must be ready to embrace and to receive. Remember that. Now, why is it important? Because very often, I mean, just imagine at that time when they're going through all this, and then another Christian tells them, no, you should not compromise. No, you should not run with them. No, you should not live in this way or behave in this way. It's unbecoming as a Christian. Now, it's easy for them to take the other person as an enemy. You know how it is in life, right? Sometimes the people that care most for us, that really wants us to change for the better spiritually, becomes our greatest enemy. Why? Because we won't receive the kiss of love, the kiss of charity. Parents, you can fully relate with that. You want to help your child so much. You're willing to bear a lot. You're willing even to be the bad guy to tell them this is wrong, this is not good. But very often you become their greatest enemy in the home, right? Their friends are their best friends outside. But parents are always the enemy. Likewise, in the church, whether it's Christian friends, whether it's um, um, the church um, elders trying to take oversight, trying to feed you, means guide you, help you, strengthen you, nourish you. Suddenly, these people are your greatest enemy, the people that you dislike the most. So this command, greet ye one another, right? knowing that people are commanded to do that, then we are, must be ready to submit to it. Now, this is the part that I hope we understand. Much has been taught about submission, right? Look at chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, the younger, submit yourselves one to, unto the elder. Now, there is a submission. Yea, all of you, be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. When we refuse to be clothed with humility, refuse to be corrected, refuse advice and encouragement that will contribute to the betterment of our spiritual walk and our spirituality, our maturity, and we reject it. We are not humble enough to say, yes, I, I need to mature spiritually. I need to change. I need to get rid of this. When we are not humble enough to submit to that, you will not receive the kiss of charity that is commanded towards you. All right? So I hope that we learn this lesson. This is the kind of Christian that we need to be, not to resist, not to retaliate. That's the opposite of submit. Now, this also means for the young ones in present, that is how you must be. All right? When daddy and mommy say something, yes, it may, it may not be what your friends um, agree with or does, but you know that it makes you spiritually better then they are just obeying God's commandment, right? Just obeying God's commandment to give you the kiss of charity. Now, so when these things happen, please don't take it personally. Please don't um, look at it wrongly. We are commanded to help one another. But I say again, don't go around looking for, all right, the little moat, a little um, speck in your brother's eyes when the moat is in our own eyes. But even if there's a moat in the brother's eyes and what the brother is telling you is correct, we still submit, all right? Now, the next. Now, maybe at this point, I want to, since we've just had our family seminar, I want to tell parents um, to take heed as well. 
Because this greet ye one another with a kiss with a kiss of charity. Now it must begin at home. Why would they come to church with a care, with a love for others, with a genuine concern for others, if at home they are not like that? This is one of the things that if you say I want to bring up godly seed, you must instill in your child at home. If they don't learn to have a kiss of charity, means this kindness, this care, this um, um, closeness with the siblings at home. So Christian parents, I hope you pay attention. If they don't have this kind of closeness at home, which is where it's supposed to be built, how are they going to be like that in the church? They'll come to church self-centered, self-seeking. They don't care about, well, um, others. Right? They don't look towards others, the, the needs of others. All right, so it's something that you say you want to bring up godly seed and this is something commanded in the church, then help them to fulfill this commandment by developing it at home. So young ones and teens, or young adults as well, if you can't get along with your siblings, especially when they're Christian siblings, please remember God even tells the, the wife who, married, who is married to an unbelieving husband, submit to your unbelieving husband. Greet him with a kiss of charity. So when you have this problem at home, worse still, if you have a problem having a kiss of charity towards your parents, towards your siblings, it is not something good at all. You need to fix it. Because God says in the church, we are to greet one another like that. Now how much more should that, that kiss of charity be at home? So please, I hope that all of us don't take the lack of kiss of charity at home lightly, especially among Christian siblings, right? This is to Christians. It will be a problem for you, eventually in church. Now, then question number eight, right? Question number eight. The next thing we want to learn is this. Oh, well, before I go forward, all right? So parents, what do you do when you go home and you see that our children have not been getting along? You have to start praying, you have to start teaching them, you have to start showing them the verse. We are supposed to keep, greet one another, Christians, with a kiss of charity. There must be a closeness, a kindness towards one another. It's a commandment, all right? So please repent. Come, let's, let's all kneel before God and ask God to forgive us. And you ask each other to for, ask, ask for forgiveness from your siblings. And change is a commandment. Please do that. It is something that they must learn at home first. Question number eight. All right, question number eight. Now, should we kiss one another as part of the Christian greetings in BPCWA? Now, why? Now, can this principle be applied to all practices of Christianity? For example, how the church should be led by men and its practices of women teaching men. All right, so why do I ask this? Now, this verse, or verses like that, greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. All right? Now, they say they, they, they did it back then, but we, we don't do it today. You know, it's, it's just... Now, actually, why do they say that? Maybe Sing Yuan. Why do they say that? No, in the past, they do it, but not today. Because it is there. They used to kiss one another as greetings. Their culture, right? It's cultural. It's cultural. So people like to take verses like that and say, well, you know, it's cultural. Even when Paul talked about women should not lead men, women should not teach uh, men, it's a cultural thing back then. Just like kisses, um, greetings were done by, via kisses. For example, it's cultural, right? So how do you answer that? Now, first and foremost, very quickly, I want to answer this because it's a common thing that Christian asks. If that's cultural, why not male leadership is also cultural back then, right? And they can cite you many examples of the cultural problems, and that's why Paul had to write it. Now, so should we kiss one another? Uh, Richen doesn't want, all right? Richen is shaking his head very vigorously. He doesn't want. Maybe you ask the ladies, right? Maybe you ask uh, Mandy. Do you think we should kiss one another with a kiss of charity? Because it's a commandment. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Okay, all right, so, so um, many takes the stand of it's cultural, all right, it's cultural. And she said, now you notice I put BPC space WA, right? Space, I want to say, I want to highlight Western Australia, all right? Now she said, well, we are mainly Asians. We are mainly Asians, and our Asian culture is not to kiss one another, it's to shake hands, all right, to smile, to bow to one another, all right? So, Cultural, so we so we don't do that. But 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 uh, we are in WA. We are in Western Australia. We are Aust Australia. You know, it's an Australian culture. Maybe I ask ask the men, uh, ask the men, M men. How, uh, Jason? Oh, you're wearing a mask because nowadays we wear masks. <laughs> we don't. Do. We are in Western Australia, right? You pretty much born born in bread here, right? Uh, so you're pretty much uh, Aussie, correct? So he's Aussie, so how? And there are other Aussies like Adrian, right? They grew up born and bred here, and many others among you, right? So why would you not do that? Right? Michelle is looking very worried at you. <laughs> They're behind her. Why, why won't you do that? It's not common in Australia? Oh, really? Oh, okay. I, I tend to see people when they see each other, then they, they go do the air kiss thing, <laughs> um, hug one another. Not common, all right? What if it's common in Australia? Now, would you, would you do it, Vincent? No. Why? Cause all kinds of problems. Like what kind of problem? Spread COVID. <laughs> of physical intimacy. All right, kiss is quite intimate. All right, so, so can you imagine uh, uh, Vincent comes in and then we have Mandy walking and then uh, he does that to her. What are you going to do, Thomas? <laughs> right? What are you going to do? Stop him quickly. Is it? Say again? You won't imagine that will happen, right? So it's hypothetical, hi hypothetical. But, but the question is, people ask, why? Why are we Australian? Now, at one period, I actually see, right? When I first arrived in, in Perth, in BPCW, I actually saw some people do that, all right? And I actually saw um, uh, an Asian, so Mandy, a, a Chinese lady, an Asian, an Asian, but pretty much grew up in Australia, all right? though not born here. And when she meets people, she hugs and that kind of thing, right? The person is not here anymore, right? But, but then it was quite, quite common. Maybe I'll ask Adrian. Adrian, was it quite... You, that people did do that? No? But I saw and said, whoa, this is quite, quite, uh, quite in interesting, so to speak, for lack of a better word. Um, did that, and then this person went, left our church, all right? When, when she came back, she did it. Also, all right, to a married man. I was like very puzzled. She did, did that to a married man, um, but not to the ladies. <laughs> Definitely not to me because of the person left because of me, right? Disagree with um, my interpretation of the Bible regarding the, the Presbyterian faith. Now, so, so people do that. People do that. Now, how do we think about this? What if someone began to say, hey, you know the Bible says we should kiss, we should kiss, we should greet one another and command us to greet one another the kiss of charity. We must do it. You know there are people who are like that? They will come and say, no, we must all kneel down during, during pastoral prayer, all right? And that kind of thing, all right? They insist we must, we must do that. Like the Bible says this, we must do it. Um, now, also, one... And Vincent is not wrong. There were prob there are problems that can also arise in that church at that time. All right? Lustful men would use it as an opportunity. Now, although it's cultural, so we can't run away. Culturally, they do that. But you notice, for example, in Romans 16, 16. Now, it says, greet one another with a holy kiss. A holy kiss. All right? So even the Bible, in, even in this culture, 
Paul uses the word, make sure it's a holy kiss. There is no lust, there is no um, other intentions in your heart. It's a pure, holy greeting to one another. It's the carefulness of treating the opposite gender as brothers and sisters, right? So, yes, potentially there are those problems. And if we, yeah, and especially with our Asian culture, we don't do that, so there's no necessity. The whole aim is a genuine charity towards one another. So there's no necessity. Now, please understand at that time, all right, they do it very commonly. Now, if we say that in Australia, all right, so I think um, 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 Jason is right, how to think about this is this. If someone begins to say that, and you begin to wonder, maybe as Christians we should do this, all right? Now, it's, they do this so commonly. When they meet outside, not in church, when they meet each other at each other's home, when they bump into each other on the street, that is how they greet one another. The moment they see each other, that is how they greet. It's really a very strong presence of that is what they do for greetings. Right? So even in WA, Jason is right, I mean, you see some of this, but it is not a heavily common culture. Right? So there's no need to enforce and say we must do this. Now, but how do you answer this? Yeah, but like I say, it's very odd. I find that, that, that this person comes back and does it to men, but not to women. <laughs> now, how do you answer this part? So we agree it's cultural. What about when they say then men being leaders, women not teaching men, What's the problem back then, right? The women, they were very aggressive, they were very strong, and then, you know, there, there was um, like woman liberation starting at that time, and then Paul had to, well, culturally, they have to handle that. And that's all, all right? Some women were very noisy in church, so he gave that command. It was specific to Corinthian church. It was a carnal church. Now, how do you answer that? That, well, culturally, um, that is, maybe that's cultural as well, so we can have women headship, Right? Women teaching men, women pastors. How do you answer that? Maybe let me try. Um, maybe I'll try the ladies, all right? Uh, Phyllis, how would you answer that? Very good. Well, now, if it is cultural, then why would God say, all right, that... In 1 Corinthians 11.13, right? You can just write it out, 1 Corinthians 11.13. So have these verses ready to answer yourself and others. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is, go is God? Christ has a head? Christ has a head over him? Yes, Christ had two. But now, in, in mentioning that Christ had a head over him, that is when, Peter, when Paul brings up the man, the head of the woman is the man. The head of the woman is the man. All right? So it's not a cultural thing. How can you say Christ, God the Father being head over Christ is cultural? Paul used that relationship, all right? That relationship to describe the relationship between men and women in the church. So... Being, is, is God the Father more powerful, more wonderful, more God than Christ just because his head? No. So just because the man is the head of the woman doesn't mean the man is superior. Just like God the Father is not superior to Christ. But it is the, the, the model, all right, of what it would be within the Trinity and then within the church, within the home. That is all. So you can't say that it's cultural. Then you have to say that Christ, the Father being, being head of Christ, is cultural as well. When Paul used this as an analogy. Now the next one, now it says, um, when it comes to women teaching men, First Timothy chapter two, First Timothy chapter two, let verse eleven, let the woman let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach or nor usurp authority over the men, but to be in silence. For Adam was first form, then Eve. For Adam was first form, then Eve. This is not cultural. 
Paul referred all the way back in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, refer it to the creation principle. God could have created Eve first, but God chose to create Adam first. First doesn't mean Adam is superior. It is simply God's, God's um, model. That's it. Right? That woman will be followers. Right? After being under the authority of men. Teaching is an authoritative role. That's all. All right? It's just God's, God's principle. That is all. So, it's not cultural. Now, then the next one. All right? So, now we come to today's lesson. All right? Let's turn to our new, new, new question sheet. Now, we come to the second part of verse 14. Second part of verse 14. Now it says, peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, what can we learn um, from this? Now, what is peace? What is peace? What do you think is peace? Now, peace is a state of tranquility. Tranquil, all right, at peace, peaceful. There is basically a sense of harmony in the heart. Now, it is a state of the Christian soul. When we say peace to the Christian, a state of the Christian soul, not fearing anything, all right? These are definitions. Not fearing anything and content with its earthly lot, content with its earthly, earthly situation. So, not fearing anything and very contented with whatever is happening in the person's life, right? whatever it is, peace. So, of course, it describes peace between people as well, right? That is why it's also here, greet one another with a kiss of charity, then peace. Make sure there's peace between one another, and also within you. So the word peace in the Bible is used to describe peace with each other, describe peace within the believer, and it also is used to describe the state of the Christian after death. He said peace, all right? He said peace. It's to describe that. The final rest. Now, it's also used to describe the reconciliation between God and men. Or should I say reconciliation between men towards God? Right? Salvation, in other words. Salvation. There's the wall that separates us from God is broken down. And now we are reconciled, in other words, at having peace with God. All right? So peace, it means these things. So he says now, peace be with you all. Peace be with you all. Now, upon whom is this peace? Question number two. Now, upon whom is this peace bestowed? And what must we realize about peace in a believer's life? When we realize that peace is bestowed upon believers. So, upon whom? Look at your verse. It says, peace with you, uh, be with you, be with you all, sorry, that are in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. So, this bestowment of peace is upon the Christians in Christ Jesus. All right? Now, remember this is a benediction. So he had a doxology in verse 11, then it's quickly followed with a benediction. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Remember we studied about benedictions? Benedictions are not mere wishes, not mere prayers of, well, God, I hope that you grant this. Now, benedictions are bestowment upon the believer, all right? Bestowment. So this is not, well, I hope that there will be peace with you. I hope. And I wish that for you. No. This is, this is a benediction where, where Peter the apostle say, now peace be with you. And amen means, let it be so and so shall it be. Remember we said, amen, what is amen? Let it be so and so shall it be. So it is a bestowment upon the believer. Now, this is only 
on believers. Please remember that. If you are not a believer, right, you do not have this reconciling peace with God. You, the wall of separation because of your sin is still there. Until you admit to him that you are a sinner and he is the only God in this universe, all other gods are false, and only he can save you and only his way can save you. When you tell him, I cannot do anything to wash away a single sin, please wash away my sins with your precious blood and save me and be my God. I denounce all other gods as false and I follow you and I want to obey you. Until then, you do not have this peace. So Peter wanted to be sure, peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. They were going through severe persecution. Peter didn't want to give them any false um, impression that this peace is for all. To make sure that if you are not saved, then this persecution that you are suffering, that you are afraid of, is nothing compared to the unrest, the horrible lack of peace, the opposite. The horrible, horrible state that you will be in eternity in the lake of fire. So here, Peter wants them to be very sure. Are you in Christ? Now, but knowing that this is a benediction, it's a bestowment of peace. Now, let me ask you this. What do you think we can learn? Every time you hear a benediction, now, um, peace be with you all in Christ Jesus. By the way, I don't think we should go around greeting peace to everyone, right? Sometimes, I, when I was working, all right, people, um, Christians, they just go around saying, oh, peace be with you, God's peace be with you, peace, 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 right? It's only those that are in Christ Jesus that have peace, right? This peace of God. Now, but now I, I ask you this question. What must we realize? If God says, Christian, you have peace, what must you realize? My hint is, there are people going through great, severe, severe, horrible persecution. Unimaginable. You put yourself like those going through the war now, ah, it's, it's worse, probably. Right? Now, then what must you learn? So imagine you are going through severe persecution, trials, difficulty, and then here Peter tells you, well, God's peace be with you. What, what do you think we must learn? Um, let me try. Benedict. Very good. Number one, it is peace. The believer's peace is not dependent on external circumstances. Now, when you read this, it must, you must find it very amazing that these people are going through that horrible, horrible circumstance and situation because of their faith. And yet, Peter says, God's peace is with you already. God's peace is with you already. Then to them, I mean, if, if you don't understand these things, Peter, are you trying to be sarcastic? Now, the fact that they are undergoing such difficult circumstances, but yet Peter can say God's peace is already with you, means peace is not dependent on the situation and what you're going through externally or internally. It's not dependent on that, that tranquil state of your soul the assurance, the harmony within your soul. The fact that, can be, that God can say, peace be with you, peace be with them who are undergoing that, really must make us realize trials, tri tribulation, testings does not affect the Christian's peace. Please remember that. Now, you are not going through trials now, so you say, ah, we, we know, we know, we know. But when you are under trials like them. Don't talk about trials like them. You are about to lose your job. You are about to fail your exams. You are about to, your health, you just got very bad news about your health. You will already forget about all this. You will be panicking, not being in peace. But always remember that God can command this peace upon them in this situation. Then it's the same for us, all right? So, now, in other words, maybe I put it another. Peace is not the absence of trouble and difficulties. Peace, the Christian peace, is not the absence of troubles or difficulties. It's not only not dependent on that, but it's, not, it's also not the absence of those things in your life. 
Because some people may feel, well, well, you know, when I'm going through trials, I must remember, my peace, God's peace that He gives me is not dependent on situation. But if you don't realize that it is also not the absence of trouble, you would say, but I would prefer not to have troubles. Right? Sometimes you always hear Christians, ah, I wish I, I wish I have some peace. I wish there is some peace. You don't have to wish that. Right? It's not just only not dependent on situation. It is also not the absence of troubles. So you don't have to keep saying, if there's no trouble, then I will, I will feel more peace. The absence of trouble does not mean peace. All right? Evidently so, here. Full of trouble. But God says peace is already with you. Now, the second thing, question number three. Now, from the context of the epistle, now, name four areas of our lives that bring, all right, sorry, that bring this peace from God. In this book, in this epistle, Peter talks about peace in various forms. Now, look up here. My question is this. Peace is not the absence of trouble and difficulties. Peace is not dependent on external circumstances and, and, um, uh, and situation. Now then, what are the four areas mentioned in this epistle that God tells us you already have peace? And peace are found in these areas, four areas. Peace are found in these four areas. Peace is not found in having no trouble. What are they? What do you think? All right, very quick one. The first one is easy guess, right? You don't even need to see, but easy. How, uh, um, grace, all right? Grace, Grace Lou. Salvation, right? So that's the easiest. Look at chapter one. Look at how he greets them. Now it begins, this chapter, this episode begins with peace and ends with peace. Now in chapter one, verse, verse one is his, he names the people, and he said, elect, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, verse 2, the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace, peace be multiplied. So because of their salvation, they can have grace and multiplied peace because of salvation. So God says, find your peace, not in the absence of trouble. Find your peace in your salvation. There is abundance, multiplied peace because of your salvation. So, Christian, how can I have this peace? All right? How can I have this peace? If I rephrase another way, in the midst of great trials and difficulty that may come upon you one day, your salvation. Think about your salvation. Well, actually, that I'm answering the next question. Well, I'll just name the four areas. First one is salvation. All right, reconciliation with God, that brings peace. Now, the second one, what do you think it is? Want to try? Um, Terry, you can Terry. It's found soon after that. All right, no time, so I'll, I'll mention, all right? Now, first one is salvation. Second one is sufferings. Peace is found in sufferings. How do we know that? Look at how he puts it. Look at verse, um, verse 6, all right? Chapter 1, verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. Remember just now we said, peace is that harmony within the soul, the contentment in the soul. Here he said, you rejoice. Rejoice what? Through, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through many full temptations and the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now here, you say, through suffering, you, you actually can rejoice. Even in sufferings, you find sufferings, sufferings actually bring rejoicing now. The question is this, why? Why does suffering, why should suffering bring you rejoicing and therefore you have peace in your heart? So you imagine, you, you, you go to work and say, so much problems at work. And then you walk there, not only rejoice, you say, I have peace. Then you walk into the office, right? Or your home, lots of problems, right? Your child is very ill or you have 
major financial difficulties, then you, well, I still rejoice and I have peace. Now, why do you feel that way? You go to the doctor and the doctor says, I'm so sorry I have to tell you this bad news. Your child is dying. Or your child contracted this, this disease and your child will be paralyzed for the rest of his life or her life. Or the doctor tell you, oh, sorry, I missed that. No, it's not your child, it's you. But yet you have peace. You walk away, no problems, right? Why does sufferings actually still can bring the believer peace? Ellen. Ellen? Very good. Because God says, I design, just now we sang, my flame shall not hurt you. I only design your dross to consume, right? Your goal, the goal to refine, correct? To consume the dross, to refine you. So, now if you turn, all right, if you turn um, to chapter 1, verses 2, 12. Just now we already mentioned it is trying of gold, right? Trying of gold. Now look at chapter 1 verses, um, uh, sorry, uh, chapter 4, all right? Chapter 4, look at chapter 4. Now verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Now when Peter used, Peter used this word, think it not strange, and they say the fiery trial, the fiery trial. He is talking about his, what he mentioned in chapter 1 about trial of your faith is like more precious than the trying of gold that perisheth in the fire. Now, Peter, when he used this word, the trial of your faith, he is using the word that describes what the, the metal smith, all right, the blacksmith, they take this gold, they take this silver, they take this precious metals and they bring it to the furnace and they put it inside the furnace. He's using that description, just like he mentioned in chapter 1. All right? So that word fiery trial is the word that, words that blacksmith describes what blacksmith does. It is to refine, means to remove the impurities in your faith. Your faith, your Christian walk is, is not pure enough. So God will design trials. God will design sufferings into your life to purify your spiritual life, make you more spiritual. Now, that is why can the Christian find sufferings even from this? Yes, look at chapter 5. Now, he keeps coming back to this same theme about, about trial. Now, look at verse 10, chapter 5, verse 10. Now, it says, after that, ye have suffered a while. So, through suffering, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So, when the Christian think of that, I have peace. When I, when I hear problems, when I see problems, but I want to caveat this, huh? please let it not be because of your sin. Don't, don't be suffering for your sin. Um, look at verse chapter 4, verse 16. If yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. All right? But make sure that in verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evil doer, as a busybody, and other men's matter. Don't, don't suffer. Don't let it be because, because of your sin. But when you know it is not because of your sin, your thought must be this. God has designed something for me. He is working. There is something that God wants to do in my life. The moment you hear, I'm sorry, you have cancer. Do you have peace? You will only have peace if you realize, if you think biblically that through sufferings, God designed sufferings to sanctify, to make me more spiritual, all right? To make me more spiritual. To make me grow to the next level. I am excited about this. That's why they, they, Peter said they were rejoicing. They understood that. They were rejoicing. God is doing something in my life. When you hear something happen to your child, what is your first reaction? Ah, why so unlucky? Or is it, I, find, I will find peace in sufferings. God has allowed it for a reason. He is in absolute control and He has planned something for me. He's working out something in my life, right? So not only peace, you will rejoice. So that's another area, your salvation. And after salvation, God will design sufferings 
Don't think it's strange. Then the third one is, you find peace in sanctification. How do we know that? Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3. So Christian, how do you find peace, all right? In sanctification, chapter 3. Now, in verse 13. Oh, sorry, not verse 13. Um, verse 15. Now, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, he says, verse 16, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, that they may be ashamed of that, that falsely accuse you of your good conversation in Christ. Now, for it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. So here he brings in conscience, having a good conscience. When you are having a good conscience, you have peace. Understand that. When you don't, why do you not have peace? Because my conscience is pricked. Why is your conscience pricked? Because I am not living in having a good conversation in Christ. My life is not reflecting Christ-likeness. My conversation, my lifestyle does not reflect that of a Christian. I'm still holding on to certain sin, right? So a clear conscience, sanctification. You find your peace in a clear conscience when you live a sanctified life. When you live a sanctified life, you will face troubles. But God says when you live a sanctified life and you face trouble, your conscience is clear. You have peace. Now the next one is we see in chapter 5, solidarity in the church. Solidarity in the church. Verse 14. Oh, sorry, verse 13. And the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Kiss of charity, the solidarity of believers. And then after that, it says peace. All right? In church. That is where you are supposed to find peace. The unity of Christian is great peace. Now, so four areas at least could be found. Find your peace in your salvation. Find peace in suffering when you understand it. Find peace in having a clear conscience, in other words, living a sanctified life. Find peace in working towards solidarity, unity, right, with one another. Find that peace. Parents, you understand that. A quarrelsome home, quarrelsome relationship at home. Singles, you understand that. Quarrelsome with your parents, with your siblings. There is no peace. But you find peace in solidarity, right? Not fighting one another. Now, then we move to the next thing. So you find that Peter don't just simply say this, all right? So I hope that you pay attention. Peter is not just simply saying peace. He has written many things to tell them how to have this peace. Question number four. Now, if God bestows peace on us, why is there still often no peace in my heart and in the churches as well? Why? You say, hang on, this is a benediction. Benediction, God says, peace in your life, believers. Peace in the church. But that it is, doesn't seem to be. Why? Why do you think it is like that? Maybe I'll ask um, um, Elder Leong, why? God, ben God pronounces that, but then it's not there. All right. Well, the first one, well, there is still sin. There are people who don't want to be sanctified. Okay. But what about the church? Still, the church is not perfect. Then why would God pronounce peace if the church is not perfect? It means there cannot be peace. There will be peace. So God says peace. But why? Why is it that although God says peace, but there are no peace in churches very often? Maybe you don't. Let's say again. Very good. Self-will. People are self-will, selfish. There's no peace in the church because people choose. They choose to create trouble. Self-will make them fight against the church, its directions, its aims. And also, well, the reason in the, in, in the personal side is now, God says, I have given you peace. Remember Christ said, my peace I give unto you. 
I get, the believer have already received the peace of Christ. And this is not just salvation peace. It's after salvation as well. Now, why does a Christian not have that? The answer is found in chapter 5, all right? In fact, it's very close context, chapter 5. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You can choose to carry all the cares in your own heart and be troubled by it. Or, like we've learned in this verse, this is a picture of someone who takes all his, all his the burdens that he are carrying, the goods he is carrying. He walks up to the donkey or the horse or whatever animal and he just takes it and he puts it onto the animal. He unloads it. He leaves it and trusts that the animal will carry it. So God here says, now if we choose not to cast all our cares upon Christ, to trust Him, to let Him lead us, work things out. Instead, we worry, we worry, we don't pray. Casting all your cares, well, one of the things you need to do is pray. You don't want to pray, you don't pray. You just want to keep fixing the thing. You don't believe in prayer then you forfeit that peace, right? What a friend we have in Jesus is a, is a, is a hymn about prayer, right? not so much about a friend. When you read the hymns carefully, it is this person who realized Jesus is truly a friend that he can trust in, right? The friend of all friends. And say, oh, what peace we often forfeit. These people understand that. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer, to cast it upon Him, right? So, well, why? It is not because God's bestowment of peace doesn't work. It is there, but we don't want to trust in it. It is there, but we don't want it, so we fight it in church. Now, another thing I hope we remember when we read this verse, peace be with you all that are in the that are in Christ Jesus, amen. Now, he's saying God's peace is bestowed upon you, church. Now, Christian, when we read that, we must be very, very afraid. Why afraid? God intends and God does bestow peace to a church. BPCWA has God's peace. Why must we be afraid? Now, if God bestows peace and we fight it and we cause trouble, we are fighting God. Please remember that. God says, I bestow peace on the church. So, so many benedictions in the Bible. I bestow peace in the church and then you disrupt that peace because of your selfishness, because of your self-centeredness and you dare to disrupt that peace. Didn't you know that I bestow peace in the church? So, do not disrupt peace in the church. So, it's one of the things that we make members vow all right? I will study the peace. I will be very serious about it. I will observe it. I will take note of it. That's why I study the peace of the church. Anything that can cause problem, I am, I am very careful. I'm noting it. I study it. And will keep the peace. Because God bestows peace. We must not dare to cause problems. Now, I remember when we made some decision in church. All right? And this person kept resisting it, right? When we moved to English and Chinese service, I'll just be very upfront about that. The person kept resisting it. And we explained and explained, we explained publicly, we explained one-on-one. -on -one. And then finally, the person said, yeah, 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 I agree with you. I agree with you. Now, Christian, when the church makes a direction and it's not evil, the Bible says the elders, they are taking oversight. And the Bible says, Submit. Don't fight if it's not if something else, sinful, all right? Don't fight. So there were many people who at that time just keep resisting, resisting. It's not good. God bestows peace. Don't disrupt it. And this person said, well, I, I agree, I agree. But you know, this person don't agree, that person don't agree, this person don't agree, that person don't agree. So I said, well, if that's the case, then the people have not spoken to me. So I'll, I'll speak to the person, all right? I'll speak to the people. And when I speak to these people, now, especially one that the person, no, this, this family, this person, they, wow, they are really struggling with the pastor. This is the wrong decision. You know, people are struggling. So I spoke with this person. 
I say, well, I understand you're struggling with this decision. Then this person says, Pastor, why do you say that? I say, well, so-and-so said that. So I say, no. I say, yeah, initially I did, but I've moved on with it. Our family has moved on already. We understand. And now when I think about it, it makes sense. We are not against it at all. See, in fact, I am very sick of meeting this person. Every time this person sees me, there's only one thing this person wants to talk about. The church shouldn't do this. Huh? The church shouldn't do this. You agree not? What about, what's your thought? And the person says, I'm sick of talking. If we've moved on, we don't even need to talk about this. Now, this is an example. When God says, I bestow peace in my church. Peace be with you all. And then you go around to stir unrest. You are telling God, God, you know, you bestow peace, but I'm going to disrupt that peace. Don't be so foolish. Why do you think God says, elders, make sure you take oversight over the church, but don't do it as lords. You don't disrupt the peace, all right? You do it rightly, biblically, and do what I want you to do. You are not the Lord. And if God moves in that direction, we follow. And they say, then, younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. The elder, all right? Not just el the elder, specifically referring to church authority. So, when you read this, before that he says, take the church, then he says, submit, then I say, God bestow peace, don't disrupt it. All right, I hope that we remember this. This benediction is not a small thing, all right? Now, next one. Next one, question number five. Now, from these areas of peace, how can I learn to have this peace? All right, then question number six. What kind of peace do we typically seek? And so on. I think we'll come back and learn. So now we learn four areas. All right, we learn four areas. Now, how can I find peace in this four areas? What should I do to make sure I have this peace in my life? I will face problems. I face problems at work. I face problems at home. I face problems in my personal life. I face problems in financial area, my health. Now, how can I look at these four areas? Not only just think, but behave rightly. And God says, I already gave you peace in these four areas. Find it there. You will have it. Let us pray. So we have here top five reasons why church dropouts, uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of, well, I take the American view, um, they are the most readily available results. They stop attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from